Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 2021 meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association here in Northeastern Illinois. Uh, as per usual, thank you for joining us. I'm Drew Carr, the current president of the club. Uh, I, as always, want to start out by telling you that this is a live program and we invite you to interact with our speaker tonight. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, if you uh, want to ask, you can, if you're watching us on Facebook, you can uh, simply put them in the comments section and we're following that and we'll pass them along to the speaker as the program is going on. If you are uh, watching us elsewhere and, or just prefer email, you can email us too. And we're also following that so we can, uh, uh, take your questions and get them to the speaker. Uh, before we get to our presentation, I just wanted to go over a, quickly over upcoming events. And it's pretty simple. This month's uh, fundamentals program, which is two weeks from tonight, is going to be on the Messier Marathon. And if you are not familiar with what that is, well, you'll learn about it. But uh, for those of you who are uh, Somewhat more experienced amateur astronomers, you'll know the Messier list of celestial objects. And you might also know that for a couple of weeks in the springtime, the early spring, you can actually, if you stay out all night, observe all 100 plus of them. So this presentation is going to be on how to do that. And we call that a Messier marathon. So uh, that'll be on Tuesday the 16th on uh, uh, coming up for our regular monthly program in March. We have a presentation from Donna Kubik of uh, Fermilab, and she's going to be talking about something at Fermilab. She's going to give us a virtual tour of their silicon detector facility. So we're going to be uh, getting a tour via your home screens of uh, where she works there at Fermilab. So that'll be interesting. Uh, as always, you can follow our uh, calendar on our club website which as I've been noting ever since we've been locked down for things is pretty sparse looking, but uh, we still put our planned presentations up. And then also if you follow us on Facebook or if you're a member and you watch our uh, club message board messages, we'll note if we have any pop-up events and, uh, and we do our observing uh, evenings and daytimes that we stream live, we plan those at the last minute. So, uh, uh, we won't be have those on the calendar. We'll only announce them sometimes just hours in advance of when we're actually going to go online. So for tonight, uh, we have a uh, guest speaker and Peggy Hernandez is going to tell us about where she works up in Elgin at uh, the school district's planetarium, which has very interesting origins uh, and uh, that stretched back over a hundred years ago from now. So instead of my rambling on about that, I'm just going to turn the screen over to Peggy and she will deliver tonight's program. So I'll stop sharing and here we go. All right, well, thank you for having me, Drew and uh, the Naperville Astronomical Association. And yes, I'm Peggy Hernandez. I grew up in Hanover Park and I went to U46 schools, including the planetarium uh, for classroom lessons, where we were bussed over to this awesome little building so we could look at the stars. And um, I started science as a, I started college as a science major, ended up getting a degree in uh, elementary education, but always had an interest in those sciences that, that I took. And um, astronomy was like a personal interest of mine. I ended up teaching three years, little kids, kindergarten and first grade. And then I did 15, 16 years of middle school science. And then uh, my remaining, I'm in my 12th year here at the planetarium, which is a school district building, considered a classroom, very unusual classroom, but that is the classroom that I teach in. So it's um, kind of like a perfect storm, my love of history. Um, teaching and kids, and then and then um, the stars and the science part uh, all go wonderfully together. So I'm going to share my screen and switch over to a PowerPoint that I have ready to go. So this unassuming little building, little gem, uh, hangs out on Watch Street at Watch and Raymond in Elgin, not too far from the riverboat. 
And it was originally, of course, not a school district building. It was originally the Elgin National Watch Company Observatory. And the watch company started 1860-ish um, in Elgin. By the 1880s or 90s, they, they built this, um, they started building the gigantic factory that is at National and um, Grove, and it's right along the river. It was a huge building, over 3,000 employees at one time in its heyday, which was probably in the 1920s. Um, but coming from Teddy Roosevelt, who announced around this time that we still needed to fix the time problem in this country. And what he meant was, we fixed the time zone thing so that we had these standard time zones, but trains were still crashing occasionally because engineers did not have watches that were all keeping time correctly. And the watch company uh, very wisely thought, well, gee, if we like make really accurate watches, we could call them engineer watches. We could sell a lot of watches. And basically it worked because that's what they did. They ended up building this observatory so they could watch the stars at night to know the exact correct time. Theoretically every night, but of course clouds would get in the way on occasion. And uh, the building is still standing. So it was uh, built in 1909, opened in 1910. And this is probably a picture from after 19, I'm gonna say probably after 1940, uh, but well before uh, the 60s. Now the 1960 is when they deeded the building over to the school district. So in other words, by 1960, the building, the, the company was out of business. They were not going to survive. They needed to do something with the building. And they decided to gift it to the school district. And then the school district ends up building the planetarium on the back. So originally it was just an observatory, um, a, a room with a telescope to actually look at the sky, which is not to be confused with the planetarium. A planetarium is a room where 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 people can sit and watch a simulated night sky on the dome-shaped ceiling. Um, and some places have both. And now, right now, we have both because we have the observatory in the front and the planetarium is in the back. That's what it looks like today. And that roof of that planetarium is not visible in that previous picture because it's not there. So that's the part that was built on in 1963. And it is a forever misconception that I'm trying to break that students that come here always think that they're sitting under this dome, which is way too small. It barely fits 15 people at a time and kids come in 60 at a time. Um, and we're not upstairs and there's no windows, but that dome is the shape that everyone tends to remember after their visits uh, with, their, with their classes. So there's a side view. That's why we fit so many people in the back side of the building. The dome fits perfectly under that black roof. Okay, here's where it all started. The very first director of the observatory was an astronomer from Minnesota. And he started, um, he was hired in 1909 and he started at age 73, which is amazing to me. So maybe he thought, yay, this is a great end of career job. Um, and there's a picture of him. This is uh, in the very building that, that is still standing today with the telescope that is still standing there today. Um, and it turns out he's got a really amazing history. He was um, also a meteorologist. He was a sciencey kind of guy. And I found a book at the library called The Children's Blizzard of 1888. It's really interesting um, about a tremendous storm that went through the Dakotas and, and Minnesota. Um, and he was actually involved at the time in very, very early what we would call weather forecasting. Um, so he was around when that happened. Um, but I also want everyone to know there is a U46 planetarium site. It's on the school district website. Um, there's an article written by this gentleman, William Payne, uh, the year after he retired, when he was in 1927, the, the current editor of Popular Astronomy, he was the first one, said, hey, you've been gone for a while at that Elgin Observatory. Why don't you write us an article? And he did. And it is super detailed and it is quoted all over the place. He outlines exactly what he did at the observatory and how he got the Elgin Watch Company Observatory started. So the U46 website is just u-46.org. And if you look under departments, you can find observatory planetarium. It's just u-46.org is how you would find it. So the building today still is standing. Uh, the door does open 
And that inside where we just saw that picture, that's the telescope. It's a transit telescope. Uh, it's permanently mounted in a, in a base with actually 60 feet of concrete down is, is practically to bedrock. And it aims only north-south. It aims exactly north-south. That's the whole purpose is you look through the telescope and you watch stars transit the eyepiece. And there's a way to measure those to, to check for the exact time based on the rotation of the Earth, based on the 24-hour spin. Um, it's a Warner and Swayze transit telescope. It's the same brand as the one uh, down at University of Illinois at their, tel at their um, observatory on campus. Uh, this is a one-of-a-kind observatory that we have because it opens with this crank. And it's a set of these worm gears. And you crank that open. And it really isn't hard to do for, for half-ton doors. Um, and it turns out that it is custom made by the the tool and die department of the watch factory. When they saw what needed to be built, it's not like you could go out and buy observatory doors and have someone install them. They looked at the blueprints, they made machinery that made watches and they said, well, yeah, we can figure something out. And that's exactly what they did. So that crank is one of my favorite parts of the building. Um, and it the, the window does, the doors do open and I open them every couple of months just to keep them oiled um, and for uh, and during public shows. We also have the original clicker. Now the clicker is what the astronomer would click when he was looking through the telescope, watching for specific stars. They use the ephemeris, which is a yearly listing of stars and the exact moment they're gonna cross uh, a whole bunch of different longitudes on planet earth. So they would look up like a couple of stars, maybe I think as many as 12 in one night, uh, no, writing down the time they were supposed to cross based on, um, well, it goes all the way back to the Greenwich Observatory uh, in England, but the U.S. Naval Observatory put out the, the ephemeris, and they would write down the times they needed to be at the telescope, and they would hit that button at exactly the moment that the star was crossing the meridian. Well, when they hit that button, it made a pen jump. This blue line I put in is just imagine a pen attached into this carriage. Well, this drum would spin one time every minute according to the slave clocks that were right behind it. So it would spin once a minute and there was a pen on here. And as this carriage went from one side to the other, uh, it would make uh, a continuous line, except for every second there was an electrical impulse that made the pen jump. So you end up with something that looks like this. So every second, there's the jump. When there's an empty space, that's a new minute. So here's the zero second and then one, two, three. Now anywhere there's an extra bump, that's somebody playing with the switch. That's somebody hitting the switch. Here's somebody hitting the switch and holding it momentarily. Uh, that made the pen lift up and then they let it go and it went down. Well, they would be able to look at this, this reading and say, all right, well, that star we were observing was supposed to cross right here um, at exactly uh, uh, 0.572 uh, seconds in between these two second marks. And, and it looks like it's a little bit off. And they would get out a ruler and they would measure the distance between the two to calculate the amount of time that the actual passing was when they click the button compared to the time that was coming from the slave clock behind them. Now that slave clock was directly attached to the master regulator clocks that were kept in a sealed room downstairs that looked like this. They, they're still, these clocks are still there. Uh, you can tell this one was running in this picture. And these are in the clock vault. One's a measured side of real time. And then they use that one, do some calculations. And the other one had solar mean time, which is what, what we humans typically use and what they would transmit for central standard time. Well, this room, had, these master um, clocks had to be in a temperature controlled room. So their correct time was just sent straight upstairs to the slave clocks that ran the chronograph machine. Now, this room had to be temperature controlled because these clocks ran on electricity. They were electrically wound, which is pretty high tech for 1909. But the rate of the swing depended on the pressure inside the big uh, bell jar that the pendulum is hanging in. If the clock was running slow, 
that meant they needed to reduce pressure. They needed to take out air molecules so there was less resistance so it would swing faster. If it was running too fast, they would need to use this bicycle pump, attach it with a rubber hose to a little spigot that's on the side that you really can't see there, and add air until the pressure went up whatever amount they needed it to go up so that it would slow the rate of the clock. So when they realized at the end of the day, after 12 readings and averaging them out and throwing out the anomalies, that, oh my goodness, the clock is off by 0 0.038. Well, they had to calculate how much air they needed to take in or out of the clock based on 18 thousandths of a second change per hour. So if, if you do, I'm sorry, on, on a barometer, one millimeter of mercury on the barometer inside the bell jar was one millimeter was equivalent to 18 thousandths of a second per hour change on the clock. So I always tell my students, yeah, they watched stars at night and then they did math all day to make sure they had the exact right amount of air that they had to put in or out of those um, bell jars in those clocks. And on the floor in that room are these light bulbs, which you might think, oh, they're great light. That is totally not what they're for. This is a small room, three foot masonry, thick masonry walls, and it had to be temperature controlled. And radiators are not known to keep a very even temperature. So these light bulbs are the exact opposite of today's. They are not energy efficient at all. Um, as a matter of fact, if you stand next to them and just turn on one row, you can feel the heat on your leg. They're very hot and they're meant to heat the room. And it had this fancy schmancy thermostat right here that would regulate the lights turning on and off when the temperature in the room changed as much of as, as little as a couple of tenths of a degree. In other words, I, I think it was kept at 81. Boy, I'm a little rough. I haven't been in the building in nine months. Um, I think it was kept around 80 degrees. And if it dropped to 79.5, a row of those lights would turn on automatically. Again, this is 1910. So we're talking like high science, state-of-the-art technology. Um, there's three separate circuits. So if the temperatures continue to drop, like in the cold spell we're going to have in a week or so, um, the next row of lights would turn on and then the third row. And then they would automatically turn off when the temperature got up to that, to that 80 degree mark. And the reason they had to keep the temperature the same is because they had to keep the pressure in the bell jar even. And if you remember back to your physics class and the ideal gas laws, if you increase the temperature or change the temperature in that room, you are going to eventually change the temperature inside those jars. And inside sealed jars, you're going to end up changing the pressure if you change the temperature. So they had to make sure that the room was temperature controlled to control the pressure in the jars. There's a little peak hole uh, in this ante room to even get into this room where there's a thermometer sitting and it's stuck through the, the masonry into the room. So there's a little sensor on the other side and they could peek in and just see that the clocks were running and everything was good without opening the door and potentially letting in cold air or warm air, um, whether it was summer or winter. Just amazing technology. Um, and these bulbs are all still sitting there. They're not brand new. Uh, they're probably from the 1930s because they quit using the observatory in about the 1940s um, when they really didn't need to. They didn't need to for the last, uh, I think over 10 years, uh, you could get atomic time signals um, and you did not need to watch the stars to get exact time, but it sold watches because people like the high tech stuff, no different than today. And they like to say that they had an Elgin watch that was timed by the stars. So they went through the motions for a number of years. But these are the last supply of uh, the light bulbs that are in the building. Now behind the chronograph machine is were two slave clocks. Uh, neither one of them is in the building anymore. One of them uh, was returned by, to Gary Kutina, who put some advertising in some horology magazines looking for it. Uh, and it turns out that both of them were eventually found uh, to, with rightful owners that bought them. Uh, one guy called and said, yeah, I have a, a clock in pieces in a box. 
and it has a number on it and I don't remember the number now but it's a numbered clock I don't know 264 or something like that and he said over the phone he's got clock it's, it's got a plaque that says 264 and Gary said well bring it over let me see it and sure enough it was the watch company slave clock and um, the gentleman let Gary put it together and display it for a couple of years uh, but he he rightfully owned it because his father had bought it at Maxwell Street around 1960, which is about the time that the watch company gave the building to the school district. They were not there at the walkthrough when the building became school district property. So somebody from the factory came over to the building and um, took those clocks off the wall and sold them at flea markets before uh, the school district got it. So. They exist. Uh, the other one is also at a clock collector um, somewhere out east, North Carolina, I think. So we know both of them exist, but they're not in our ownership. So there's a backup view of the chronograph machine. It had weights on it to um, keep the time. It was directly tied to the time that was on the clocks that were right behind it. And I like to, sh uh, uh, clock people I know love to see this thing. It, would go back and forth and I don't know too much about the mechanism itself, um, but it is an, a really neat original chronograph machine. So I'm gonna pause here and see if we have any questions like up to this point. So we're at, we're at 1910 when the observatory opened and it did measurements of the stars through, through the 1920s and into the 30s. So no questions, but it looks like you have a little fan base that's uh... <laughs> that's uh talking good. to me on facebook so good excellent well you know i you guys are watching through the um naperville astronomical association it's a great little um astronomy club you guys can all join the club and they do all sorts of little shows like this so all right so i'll keep moving so uh back up to the observatory room the telescope room upstairs um, you'll notice if you look out this window, there's an obelisk sitting there. And if I circle it, you might notice it a little bit more, a little Washington monument out there. So here's a view of the backyard. And on top of it, there's actually a, an Army Corps of Engineer, a placard marking it, because this monument is exactly, exactly north of the middle of the eyepiece of this telescope. Like if you kept walking that way, in a straight line and just walked over buildings and over every, you would eventually be at the North Pole. It is exactly north. The telescope had to be lined up exactly north-south so that as the earth rotates, when you look through the telescope, uh, you just can watch everything go by. And once every 24 hours, the same star would come back into your view. And as a side note, this was a weather station. I'll go back to that if there's time. There was a, a weather station that sat on those four legs. So that's the obelisk. It had a house around it. It had a little shed around it. It was called the Mark House. And in this Mark House, there was an artificial light source. And we have one of the contraptions that was the artificial light source. It was made at the factory itself. It's got uh, watch factory stampings on it. Super bright light. And it was aimed at this hole. And that hole was lined up perfectly with the height of the telescope. So every evening, they would aim the telescope directly at this, this artificial light source and make sure that it was right in the center of the telescope. They wanted to make sure that every single 24 hours when they went to do observations, the base of that telescope did not budge, not even a millimeter, because that would make their crossings off. They, they wouldn't match up with the ephemeris exactly. So they wanted to be super duper accurate. I mean, crazy accurate. Um, in order to figure out where to put that on the property, the Watch Company Observatory and a George Comstock from Washburn Observatory up at UW-Madison that had been put in place a few years prior to the Elgin one, um, they set up observing nights where the two of them would watch the same stars cross and using telegraphs, they would measure the time that elapsed between when they saw the crossings to calculate how far east or west their telescopes were from each other. And since the Washburn telescope location was known, they would be able to figure out the exact longitude of our telescope. So they knew what readings to look up in the ephemeris to do 
the readings. And I have the letters back and forth that these gentlemen wrote to each other. They're today what we would probably call phone calls. Like, hey, you want to watch tonight? Nope, can't do that tonight. And this guy couldn't do it on Wednesday the 15th. Um, but eventually they did. And I have the results on linen that I've scanned for posterity here. It's written on linen. And these are the final results of the work, Professor George Comstock at the Elgin Observatory. And it looks something like this, some of the, the reductions that they did. And man, oh man, sort of takes me back to math class in like high school. And I would just circle that big number like 10 times. Like that is my answer and I'm sticking to it because look at all that work. So they did readings on the same nights and had to calculate how far off they were from each other. Turns out we're like four minutes and 21 seconds east of Madison, Wisconsin. That's it. We're really, it's almost straight north of us. So if you're into this kind of stuff and you know how they do reductions, this is a fun sheet to look at. There's also, remember, they had that lighthouse that mark house with the light so they could make sure that that light was directly in the center of the telescope. There were minor adjustments they could do on the base of the telescope. And then there was this big contraption. Um, and this just sits on the wall in front of that window. These two things are handles. There, there are two handles. You can grab this. And there's a level where that arrow is pointing. You can just barely tell. It's, it's a level. The water's in there with the bubble and everything. It turns out this contraption is called a level tester. I found the blueprints. And I opened them up and I finally said, oh, I figured out what this thing is. It's a level tester. I cleaned it up with um, super fine uh, steel wool and mineral oil. And it, it turns out well, that's, the, that's that level again. And these are the two handles where you would grab it. And, and there's numbers on here and you can twist this little thingy and you twist that thing like a quarter of a turn and it changes the bubble. So this contraption made sure that this level was level because they use these, these two handles. You could pick that up and turn around and set it on the telescope. There they are. You could set it on the telescope and the level right there would tell you if the telescope base had somehow shifted this way overnight big truck going by, earthquake, whatever. Um, and they could make minor adjustments for that. They, they could fix it. So this is a level to make sure that the telescope's level, but it's housed in this thing that's a level tester. And then I always wonder, is there a level tester for the level tester? Like, how do they know that? I, I don't know. But then the watch company was really, really, really into being precise and bragging about that, that sold watches. So they did this when they needed to, and then they continued going through the motions even after there was technology that you could get the exact time without having to do all this um, leg work. So any questions yet? Uh, yes, we do have uh, one question. What was the name of the watches that uh, the Elgin Watch Factory made? Are those still in circulation from a collector point of view or? Okay, great question. Yeah, they, they're actually called Elgins. Um, and of course they had a bunch of different lines like the Lord and Lady Elgin. Those were the top of the line ones. And they actually did have names. Um, some of the early um, uh, leaders in the company like the Raymond um, they would have a watch line named the Raymond line. And um, they are, you can go on eBay and look for vintage Elgin watches. Uh, there could be 60 on at the same time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of them. Now, when you say vintage Elgin, it, it, it depends. Like they also continued to make watches um, after their heyday. Um, and unless it has a wind up on it, that it's a wind-up watch, no, no batteries, no quartz. Um, uh, the wind-up is a real Elgin watch. It, it has to be a wound, jeweled watch to be an Elgin watch. Uh, they didn't ever really delve into the dollar watches or uh, the battery-powered watches. Now, when they went out of business, they did sell the Elgin name. And you can still find 
Elgin watches at JCPenney and Sears, as long as they exist um, online, Amazon, you can get Elgin watches, um, but they are not Elgin National Watch Company watches. The, the name was sold and they're nothing like uh, the original at all. So anything that's not a wind up watch basically is not a true vintage Elgin watch, but there, I mean, most of them aren't working and there's, um, there's a website. If you do have an Elgin watch, you can open up the back and there's a serial number and you can enter in the serial number and it'll tell you like what make, what model, what's its approximate value and, and all that stuff. So yeah, they definitely still exist. I mean, and if you had, think back to a parent or a grandparent or whatever, an aunt or an uncle that lived in the 20s and 30s. If they owned a watch, chances are it was an Elgin watch. They sold 60 million watches, sold 60 million watches in the 100 years that they were in existence. I mean, it's like Nike. Is That's how I compare it to uh, with kids when they come in. And I always, I look around, I say, I'll bet you that half of you either saw, heard a Nike commercial before you came here today, or you're wearing something that has Nike on it because they're everywhere. And, and sure enough, a bunch of kids will have, see the swoosh and, you know, on their socks and whatever. And uh, Elgin watches were just so common and every day that it was, it was a normal thing. So um, if you talk to someone that's old enough, they'll, they'll totally recognize the name. Okay, no, no other questions. All right, so, so that's the observatory part of the building. That's where they, that was the reason that the building was built. They wanted to do exact time. They took advantage of this need for exact time to be on engineer watches so that trains wouldn't crash. Um, now the building also had uh, an actual like uh, telescope that you would use outside. This is the tube for it. Um, it's like a four and a half inch refractor. It's, it's a brochure. It is from 1910. Uh, you can see the, the weights are down here. That's the eyepiece for it. This is just a device that sits in the corner to kind of hang on to it. And it's got a beautiful um, tri-legged base. And it takes like two adult men to carry it inside and outside. It is so heavy, but that's needed to keep it nice and steady. And here I am using it at the transit of Venus back in 2012. And we are projecting an image of the sun on this white paper here that this guy has taken a picture of kind of in our way with his cell phone. But, uh, you know, easily 10 people could stand there and watch Venus. Venus. You can barely see the little black dot. We watched Venus uh, transit the sun using this 1910 vintage Brashear telescope. So that was pretty fun. Um, the factory was huge. It was a huge part of Elgin. I mean, if you were alive and you lived in the era of the watch factory until they tore it down in 67, 66 maybe, um, you knew where the factory was. It had a 144 foot clock tower. They didn't make clocks. It's not an Elgin clock. They made watches, um, but it was like a big Ben. And at one time, I, I think the number's 3,000. 3,000 people working in this factory. Um, they were very progressive. Had one of the first um, paid holidays. They had um, a pension plan. Uh, these things were not very common in that time. And um, they had a nurse, they had a little health clinic on site. They had um, so many people working that in the 1920s, uh, women and men both, in the 1920s, women were released four minutes earlier than men from their stations because they wore heels and they went down the stairs and there was worry that they would jostle each other and the women would fall because they had their heels on uh, and then the men would come out four minutes later and it was just I'm sure I've seen other pictures it was just a stream of humanity coming down Grove Street, which had all sorts of shops. Of course, you had employees that had paychecks and money walking every single day down Grove Street. Um, and that's said to be one of the reasons why Elgin always had a large amount of dress stores and hat stores and especially stuff for women because there were women in the 1920s and 30s that worked there and had spending money of their own. And after the watch factory closed, of course, many of those little uh, shops, uh, you know, went out of business partly because they didn't have the factory workers, um, the factory women there doing the shopping. So 
this is the factory at about 1910. Now they built the observatory behind here. Like if you kept crossing the river here at National Street and hung a right, you'd be at the observatory. And so here's a picture from 64. You can see the clock tower in the background and a wing, a whole wing of the factory. And here's a gentleman walking into uh, the brand new U46 Planetarium and Elgin National Watch Company Observatory. Now, the observatory in 1964 hadn't been used in 20 years. Um, the observatory was used, the building was used for research after the 1940s for storage. Um, there, there were things done there, but they weren't watching the stars for a long time. So a, a lot of people ask about that. Oh, are you going to open it up and look? Well, it's not that kind of a telescope anyway. It's a transit telescope. You can't turn it to look at anything, and it hasn't measured time. Um, so now we're talking it hasn't measured time in, in over 60 years. So we, we don't use it. It's like an antique. And the original um, director in the building, Mr. Don Tuttle, um, recognized very quickly who, who was an astronomer. And he was also a radio, a radio guy in the Navy. And um, he needed a job. So he was actually hired by the district to do the WEPS, the um, radio station. He was the FAA engineer that, that ran it. And he also had an astronomy degree. And then two years after he works here and kind of subbing in the high school for physics classes and doing the radio station, the district gets an observatory. Talk about right place at the right time. So he walked in and realized after the first year of trying to have elementary kids come up to the observatory and tell them about time telling that a planetarium would actually be a much better room to teach in. So he really advocated for getting that planetarium built on the back. So if you ever drive down National Street in Elgin, it's right by the riverboat, this shopping center called Clock Tower Plaza has these big pillars out front. And those are actually, and this black fencing, those are actually left over from the factory. So if I go back, so there's a sidewalk here. If you go to the left, that sidewalk goes kind of up on a hill towards the observatory. So we're right by the river here. Well, if you go up that hill and turn around, you can see those two pillars right there. And that black fencing went all the way around the factory. That black fencing um, was because of classified projects they did there. During World War II, they were very patriotic, did a lot of timing devices, munitions devices for the war. Um, and since they had federal contracts, they had to circle the whole place with a fence. So that's not original from the 1890s when they first built over there. Um, and here's a view from Grove Street. Coming down Grove Street, I mean, you can't miss this gigantic factory, but you can still see those pillars right there. Today, you drive through those pillars to go to Butera and, and Family Dollar and Subway and Dunkin' Donuts. It's a, it's a strip mall. And again, you can see the pillars right there. So the bike path is right here where that train track is. The river's right behind the photographer here. And that's the entrance into um, the factory right there. And today, if you go over to that shopping center, and if you read really, really fast, because you got to drive in about, I don't know, 30 feet, and then you got to turn right or left, and you're looking at this sign the whole time. But you got to keep going because there's no stop sign. Um, so I had to get out and park and come over here and read about this, that this is the site of where the factory was. And time sold Elgin watches. Father Time was there logo and here he is again different version older version same same idea so gm wheeler wheeler was another guy a big wig in the company so there was a whole wheeler line of watches they often use the observatory or stars in their advertising um, to promote that idea timed by the stars time from the stars the elgin watches at elgin's famous observatory there's a little star down here um, it was very common for them to like combine the two. It was a marketing strategy and as well as state-of-the-art technology. So they also, when uh, the watch company ex executives early on, their, their offices were in downtown Chicago, not Elgin. Elgin had cheaper land and cheaper labor. So they built the factory all the way out in Elgin, but their building on Jewelers Row in Chicago um, needed a clock outside. They commissioned and paid for and had this clock installed and notice it says Elgin time on it. And you got Father Time, the Elgin company logo holding an Elgin watch, of course. And these, these were light bulbs that went off. Every second a light bulb would turn on and at the end of the minute, poof, they'd all go black and start over again. 
And I went downtown a few years ago and I found it. Um, it's at like this weird whacker and eat Swabash or something. And the time was correct. Uh, but you might notice that they took the Elgin watch out of Father Time's hand and put the, the, the hourglass back in. And they scratched off Elgin time on all four sides. It just says time. Um, but at one time, they were sending the time signal from our observatory on the utility lines directly to their offices. So I also, I also guess that they were very, very often asked what the time was because they always had the exact time there at the factory. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't not know that they had exact time. So they put it right outside where everyone could see and they could see that brand recognition of Elgin time. So here we have the classic Elgin pocket watch. So this is in the observatory building upstairs. This is after they were using it to measure time, but they started using it for um, research. Um, he's actually doing radio signals. This is a, a transmitter for the radio signal that they would send out. They would allow radio stations to transmit the time on their broadcast, as long as somewhere during the broadcast, when they did the beep and would say beep, the time now is 12 noon from the Elgin National Watch Company Observatory and like do a little promotion of Elgin watches, they were allowed to promote, uh, they were allowed to give off the time signal. And it was wonderful advertising. It sold Elgin watches without a doubt. They also did some um, mainspring, some metal work, um, uh, research in the building. They also have a connection to the World's Fair. And uh, it's really interesting to read about. Um, the photo cell was a big thing uh, in, in the 1930s. So this is 40 years after the Columbian Exposition. And um, somebody came up with this idea. I'm very much shortening this. Th this idea that for at the World's Fair in Chicago, why don't we, um, you know, con contribute to this photo cell project and, and let's get the light from a star that Arcturus is a star that's up, that's about 40 light years away. So the light leaving that star Arcturus left during the Columbian Exposition in 1892 and it took 40 years to get here. Why don't we use that light on the photo cell to trigger the switch to turn on the lights for the fair? And I'm pretty sure it was done from U of I this little, you know, not game, but you know, like, oh, let's, let's flip this switch. And then it worked and people loved it. The turning on of the lights with the photo cell. Um, and it was Harvard U of I, Yerkes Observatory and Allegheny Observatory that worked together to do this. Well, the Elgin National Watch Company um, originally didn't have plans to do anything, but people loved it. So they said, hey, well, we'll do it. Like we'll, we'll turn on the lights every night. And they built this, this stand outside on the property and a 20 inch reflector and, and collected light uh, and, and used it to turn on the lights at the World's Fair every night. Now, I, I don't know super details about exactly how this worked. Um, you know, part of me thinks, well, you know, there was someone in the back room and they yelled, hey, George, okay, do it now. Um, but they definitely were collecting light here. They definitely had a photo cell working and um, it's very likely they could send a signal over to the fair to get the lights turned on. And again, it was a promotional thing that got them some exposure for Elgin watches at the time. So this is on the property. Um, these two, this building is gone. It's not a building, it's a mansion, the Collingborn Mansion, Collingborn Threads that sold off to Lee Wards years ago is still there. Um, and that house is, is not there. That was torn down in its apartments, but the, the house down here is still on the street. So watch company ends up going out of business. And boy, that's a, that's a long story too. But they went out of business. So here it is, 1960s. They've got this incredibly dated, decrepit, not well-maintained, not kept up, electric, everything was in dire need of repair. Um, and it was for sale for years. Nobody bought it. They ended up tearing the entire thing down. It was a sad day for the history of Elgin um, to see it come down. And then around that time, 1960 is when they deeded the building over to the school district. 
And Mr. Don Tuttle was the radio guy that actually was an astronomer that was helping out subbing for physics classes that they get, said, hey, you've got yourself an observatory now. Let's see what you can do with that. And he advocated to get this planetarium that we have still today built. He has, a, there's original advertising pieces still in the building. It's a Spitz A3P projector that he ended up buying. And they got, it comes with all of the specs and like what it can do. And uh, this model ended up being the workhorse model for the company. Uh, hundreds of them were sold across the country, community colleges and school districts in the 1960s installed them with that Sputnik money, the National Education Act, uh, where the feds funded 50% of all planetariums that were built in public um, school settings. Um, and here's an ad from a magazine for their A3P and they list Elgin Public Schools as one of the recent installs. And here's a picture, I, I, I don't know if this is like how old it is, I don't think it's opening night, um, but notice the reel to reel for the audio right there. And much is the same. The console is still there. It's the same. The projector is still there. It's the same, well kept. It has had uh, maintenance done on it by a professional every single year since it has been installed in, in our building since 1963. It's in excellent shape. I still use it all the time for programs. Um, and that's what it's for. It's a school district classroom. So classes come all day long. I see four to five sessions a day up to two teachers at a time, up to 60 kids at once. And uh, Don did the same thing every single day. And here is um, the 500,000th student walking through the door uh, with her teacher. And Mr. Tuttle gave her a little, a little prize for being the millionth, the 500,000th you know, customer. Um, I, I'm going to guess that he, somebody took the picture at a bad moment. She, she doesn't look terribly excited. Maybe it's because it's a teacher's quiz that she won. Maybe she was hoping for something else. I don't know. Um, but that was October of 1984. So I am certain we have doubled that by now. So there's been well over 1 million school students that have walked through the doors for lessons about space and the stars. In addition to the evening programs, uh, Mr. Don Tuttle was famous for a show called The Star of Bethlehem that uh, worked through the, the triple conjunction uh, around Christmas time and the astronomical potential explanations. Um, and Mr. Tuttle also, and Mr. Kutina who replaced him, Gary Kutina, um, built telescopes in the basement with hobby clubs, uh, with uh, classes, with a, a special gifted class called the Junior Astro Society, real bright kids that came in and uh, made telescopes. And they sometimes use this automatic telescope lens grinder that, um, Steve Muckow and Mark Kuntz and Don Tuttle went and got from a lady in Rockford. And uh, it was a machine would run and it would spin and there was a buffer on it and you could actually do the grinding automatically. And I'll have you know folks that this chain is actually made out of leather. It is a leather chain on this telescope grinder. And here is one of the recipients, one of the makers at age 10. This gentleman standing here is Hal Getzelman. He grew up in Wayne. And he not only went with his classes, but he was invited to be a junior astro member. He learned how to run the planetarium projector with Mr. Tuttle. And he made his first telescope, a four inch reflector at the observatory planetarium. And he just recently retired as a capsule commander from on the International Space Station for NASA. He is the first non-astronaut to make it as a capsule commander. Um, I, I'm, I think his degree was physics and maybe electrical engineering. So he was the one that could talk to the people up in the space station or heading to the space station. He was the only one allowed to have communication back and forth. So he had to read the room and find out what he needed to tell them. Um, and it's short, it's Capcom for short, um, until they ended the shuttle program. And then he worked in safety right before he retired. He was in charge of uh, coming up with plans that while they're on the International Space Station, if there is debris, space junk, uh, a bolt, a piece of metal, a rock, if something were to um, penetrate the layers, how many layers would it penetrate and what's the procedures and what rooms do they have to evacuate everyone to? Um, and that was the final work that he did um, at the planetarium. So he came back 
and uh, enjoyed a show given to him by um, Mr. Kutina, who was the, the director at the time. Mr. Tuttle came over and visited as well. This was 2009. Mr. Tuttle has since passed on. Um, and Gary has retired. And Hal, Hal Getzelman is his name. Um, still occasionally has contact uh, with me here at the planetarium when he's in town visiting family, usually. So um, Gary Coutina also got the building on the National Register of Historic Places in 1994. No easy feat, uh, but the whole front part of the building is registered um, as historic because it is. It told time. Uh, they sent time from the Elgin Observatory for years that was transmitted over the radio and still sees school groups today. Of course, I've been closed since March of last year. Um, our district is in hybrid mode right now, so students are starting to come back, um, but we have not figured out a reasonable way to justify an entire bus to come over to bring maybe 15 kids in at a time when we are in dire needs of buses because we have to space them out. So I will likely continue do, to do uh, Zoom virtual programming for the rest of this year, which I have been doing. For, for the year. So students that are going to school remote are getting lessons from the planetarium based on the curriculum um, through me, the teachers sign up and they go to the planetarium and I use Stellarium software and other available online resources to sort of mimic the night sky and teach them about space. So any questions? I know that was a lot. There's still a lot more. I could talk about this forever, but I'd like to know if there are any questions and uh, we'll kind of be wrapping up the program here. So if you have any questions about the, the old watch factory, the newer planetarium, anything, I can take those now. So we had one comment that a, a gentleman finished a six inch mirror in the, the basement of, of that. Yay, a junior Astro member. And I can tell you, if I knew your year, I could look up your name and what session you were in. And if your mom was dropping you off because all those records were kept inside the building. And that, that's wonderful to hear that you made a telescope here. And chances are the telescope you made is still here in the basement. They were used for years and years where teachers could sign them out and bring them back to their buildings and host their own evening programs on uh, school building sites in the evening. Uh, one question, uh, is the building open to the general public when it's not during COVID? Yep, another good question. Yes, I do have public shows about four times a year. And they're in the evening, usually on a weekday, I'll do two identical programs, usually at 4.30 and 6.30, maybe 5 and 7. Um, we post them on the Facebook page, Twitter, the school district web page. Um, they have different themes. Sometimes I'll do a, a, a show. I also have a digital projector. So I have a few uh, canned programs like One World, One Sky from Adler Planetarium is a, a great kindergarten first grade program. So sometimes I'll have a great family program for littler kids. Sometimes I'll just do a history program uh, that's really more for adults, um, but they're generally family programs. And if you come early, uh, you can walk the building. I have high school docents that act, uh, volunteers that act as docents in each of the rooms, the chronograph room, the telescope room, and some displays in the basement. Um, so yes, I don't think any of that's gonna change if, if we end up being allowed to be in any kind of full in-person mode, we could potentially have one in the spring. Um, but I would say more likely next school year is when we would probably go back to doing those. I've also always been on the um, April, like the second or third Saturday in April is the Chamber of Commerce's um, Open Elgin, they call it. And they find historic buildings in Elgin that open their doors for visitors to walk through. And um, the last three years I have been part of Open Elgin and um, it's just a free day. You can come over and check out the building, go inside. And sometimes I do a little bit of a star show if there's a bunch of people in the building at one time, but it's just open house style. Just walk in, walk out. Uh, there was a comment uh, that they heard that the, at the 1933 World's Fair, it didn't work on opening night. Uh, do you know if that's true? 
it has been a while since I read up on that, but there is some literature out there. Um, honestly, if you Google it, you, en you end up finding it about exactly how it came about. But I do vaguely remember reading that it, it didn't go off without a hitch. So I think that's where my line of thinking is coming from that like they kind of went through the motions like, yeah, they had a telescope. Yeah, it was connected to a photo cell, but you know, they really had Harry in the back room ready to lift the switch in case it, it didn't go off as planned. Um, because I do think that there was a glitch with it. I do, I do think there was. And then I'm not, I'm not sure what this means, but maybe it means something to you. Uh, somebody asked, have you found the 200 years of astronomy films yet? Does that mean anything to you? No, 200, oh, okay. 200 years of astronomy films. I haven't, although, although they potentially could be in the building. There are, there's a small collection of reel to reel videos. And I, there was an eight millimeter and I had it digitized and it was a video of Mr. Don Tuttle's hand in um, a pot of the, I'm drawing a blank on the name, the tar that they would mix up to use to grind the telescopes, the pitch, so it was how to make the pitch correctly and like do whatever you do with it. And there's these other ones that I still haven't gotten to a projector to actually look at them. So maybe somebody is, maybe it's a junior Astro member that saw an old reel to reel called 200 years of astronomy. I, I, I don't know, I'm kind of guessing, but um, no, I haven't found it, but it might be in the building if there is such a thing. <laughs> So he, he just uh, commented back, he said he worked on that show and even appeared in a few scenes. He worked the pointer and projectors during the public shows. Oh, a stellar, a stellar junior okay. Astro member. That totally makes sense. Part of being a junior Astro member, well, you got to come to the planetarium and miss a little bit of school because you had to get a ride from a parent over at around three o'clock in the afternoon and then you'd stay till about four and, and there were steps graduations like you had to memorize constellations you had to memorize the board you had to run the projector you had to do a two-minute show then you had to do a five-minute show and you had to know how to do that stuff so um, I would love for you to come to a public show I have a little book uh, quite a few junior astro members come back and I have a little journal for them to sign names and like tell me things like this and and have it down written so we have a written history of of these events that happened um, and it doesn't surprise me that he had had you helping run the program. And if you did it as an adult and not a school age student, that isn't a surprise either. Don, um, you know, worked with a lot of fellow astronomers and especially, I mean, he kept teaching astronomy at ECC until like he couldn't, cause it was gonna start, he was gonna start not getting his pension because he, if he kept working there. So then he ended up working there, I think volunteer like he had an astronomy for fun class um, uh, well into his 80s. I know that. So um, I know he worked with a lot of people and a lot of people learned from him uh, using that projector. And you might be, you might be talking about a slideshow. Um, yes, I have, I have probably a hundred slide reels full of of programs, tons and tons of slideshows. And that might be the title of a program that was used frequently. So it, if he had it, it's in the building still. I do still have those. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, yeah, there's no more questions coming in. All uh, right. Thank you very much. You got, you, there's a lot, I, I'll, uh, send some of these to you afterwards but you have a lot of people saying thank you very much and they enjoyed your show and uh, hey. uh, very very uh, very nice comments complimenting you so excellent well thank i you. love i love doing it i love being i love teaching in the building I, I i mean i love everything about it when kids are in there and and i always say that i i just love when the kids are in there it's all the adulting that's not as fun but but when the kids are in there and they're like mouth ajar and like, oh, wow, that's, oh, now I get it. Uh, it's, it's just really, really a cool place to work and to learn. And I keep learning more and more. 
as I uh, with the with the blizzard guy, the original director of the place was one of the first meteorologists in the world. Like he worked on predicting, tracking temperature and pressure and wind and figuring out that everything went across the country from west to east. And and the in that balcony, you see that thing that that's actually there's a, a big anemometer on the top. Uh, there was a the whole place had weather stations that were kept up until the 1960s. Well, it turns out he was a trusted meteorologist. So the beginnings of the National Weather Service trusted this William Payne guy to get accurate data. So this was like a data collecting point for meteorological data that goes back to some of the earliest records in the country. Um, and they were sent from here, either by telegraph or um, uh, telephone. The, the numbers were sent over and that's all they did with it. They just collected data, no weather predicting or anything else just sending the data over so they had numbers to work with. It's really interesting stuff. You, uh, we had one more question come in while you were talking. Uh, oh, we have two questions coming. Uh, funds for the observatory now, do they come from, does just the uh, school district pay for it or is it funded through some other, some other means? It is funded through the school district. This is a school district U46 building. It's a classroom, a standalone classroom, very unusual. Um, and there has been a lot of support from the U46 Education Foundation, um, which has gifted the planetarium with some of those canned programs. One World, One Sky that we got from Adler Planetarium uh, was actually paid for by U46, the Education Foundation funding. So um, that's, that's, those are donations from the community the, the foundation money, but the maintenance and um, is all done by the school district. The, the shoveling every day, the maintaining the boiler. Um, there's somebody, there's a maintenance person that comes over every single day that I have a relationship with because I'm kind of like the first responder to a really old building. So I, I know everything, what it sounds like, and I know when something doesn't sound right, and if something doesn't seem to be working, and I I get on the horn and they're very responsive. And like me that love this building, we have some plan operations members um, that also love the building and they wanna take really good care of it. So I get really good responses for uh, the building being taken care of. Um, so the build district sponsors the maintenance, me and a bus. They dedicate a bus that I schedule to have school districts, school classes come like pretty much continuously throughout my school day. First thing in the morning, 8.30, the first group comes, usually three in a row um, right away, and then a, a one or two after lunch every single day. And one more, maybe the final question, uh, <laughs> you know, was the, the scope inside there normally pointing to the north or the south? Oh, yeah, it points north-south. It's It pivots. It can go all the way facing northern horizon straight up and then it goes all the way down southern horizon that's it it's right on the meridian exactly I think, was, I think what he was asking was the stars that they would time would those normally be circumpolar stars in the north or would they be southern stars typically southern stars although okay. i do i have seen records that they did occasionally do a northern star and i i don't have an explanation exactly why or what the thinking was but they were almost always uh, southern stars. Yep. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Oh, southern stars. All right. I think that's everything. Thank you again very much. I'm You're gonna very welcome. Over, I'm going to flip over to Drew now. And I will stop share. Okay. Thanks okay. for having me. This was fun. It's always fun to share. I, I love talking about it. I love showing it off. And I love when we can get the community in with public shows. Well, thank you very much, Peggy. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm looking down and I can see that the, the Elgin watch time is uh, 834. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, that's uh, my, one of my pocket watches. And nice. you have an Elgin because uh, it's, uh, <laughs> nice. I'll go back to uh, sharing here. We will finish up with our, um, our uh, business meeting, which is very abbreviated uh, these days. And... I go up here, um, turn the microphone at least over to our secretary, Kathy, who uh, will 
will pass along any reports that any of the officers have given to her to uh, share tonight. Kathy, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. And thank you, Peggy. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, You're very welcome. Thank you. For the reports, I have a report from the treasurer, Jack. Um, the NAA has renewed its nonprofit status with the Internal Revenue Service for the 2021 year. And the NAA continues to have a healthy financial picture with our bank account containing $12,070, more than budgeted expenses. And the set of proposed amendments to the club's constitution that were in the ballot in January passed and have been adopted. Uh, the program chair's report from Kurt is our Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 speaker will be Fermi Lab scientist and fellow member Donna Kubik. Her presentation will be a virtual tour of Fermi Lab silicone detector facility. And then from the fundamentals coordinator, Laura, the fundamentals for February will be on the Messier Mar Marathon, the March Astronomy Fundamentals Program Tuesday, March 16th, will be an overview of astrophotography for beginners. And then in April, it's on celestial navigation. And then the Alcor report from Elias is the Astronomical League just unveiled a new observing program only for people of ages 17 and under. It's called the Youth Astronomer Observing Program. It's intended for youths older than the sky puppies age of 11 years old. And that's all I have for today. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, so that wraps up things for uh, this evening for the Naperville Astronomical Association. If you're a member, you're welcome to uh, sign into our Zoom meeting. The uh, link was sent out in the newsletter. It's sent out today in, on the message board. Um, this is our way of socializing when we can't get together so <laughs> in person. So uh, feel free to join us for that. We will be starting it in just a few minutes after we close this meeting out, which I'm about to do. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And uh, please do follow us. And uh, also remember that this program will, in a few days, be put onto our YouTube channel, where every program, pretty much, that we have streamed, whether it's a monthly meeting or one of our fundamentals programs or one of our observing uh, sharing nights, uh, there edited and they're up there on the YouTube channel to review. So if you miss something or if you want to share something with somebody else, that's the place to do it. Just go to YouTube and search for Naperville and astronomy. And those two words will get you to our channel. So uh, we have well over 30 programs up there now to look at. Otherwise, Please subscribe. We need, we need the more people we get to subscribe, eventually we can get a, a better uh, URL. I'm not telling you go to YouTube slash anything because currently our YouTube slash is a big long line of gibberish and <laughs> if we get more people to subscribe uh, which uh, doesn't cost anything by the way uh, if you do that when you go visit us there we will be able to get a nice short URL like YouTube slash Napier Astro or something like that uh, hopefully someday do subscribe that's a good point Jim anyway otherwise for tonight folks thanks a lot for joining us Keep on going outside and looking up at the sky and enjoying astronomy. And so good night for now.